Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm at Pimlico and as you can see behind me, people are getting ready for the 149th running of the Preakness Stakes. And that got us to wondering, how do we get a Preakness? How do we get a Pimlico? And what about that enormous trophy, the Woodlawn Vase, that gets presented to the winner each year? Let's jump in and we're going to start our story not in 1873 when the first Preakness was run, but in 1870 when a first race called the Dinner Stakes was run at a brand new Pimlico. A horse from a town in New Jersey uh, showed up at the track that was so gangly, the trainers joked that he was more like a cart horse than a race horse. Um, that the horse was named after the New Jersey town, which derived its name from the Indian word for quail woods, Paraquales. That horse, of course, went on to win despite all odds. Uh, and the name of the town and the horse is Preakness. That's how we get the horse Preakness. What about the race? Preakness. We'll jump forward to 1873 and the three-year-old Pimlico decides it needs a new race. They turn to their president, Odin Bowie, former governor, to name it and he goes, uh, he chooses to go back to that long shot horse that won the first dinner stakes. Um, Bowie, in fact, was the one who came up with the idea for a dinner stakes race. He was having dinner with his horse-owning friends in uh, Saratoga, Saratoga Springs, New York. Think Belmont, the third leg of the Triple Crown. They came up with the idea with, for a race where the winner would buy the loser's dinner. I guess wagering might work differently among horse owners. I don't know. Um, and uh, But the uh, Belmont uh, folks wanted the race to be held there. Bowie said, if you hold it in Baltimore, I'll build a brand new racetrack. And in fact, he did. He built Pimlico. Incidentally, it's named after a 16th century English tavern named Pimlico that shows up in Ben Johnson's play, The Alchemist. Apparently, the Pimlico Tavern was known for its nut brown ale. That's how we get the name uh, Pimlico. Um, so before we turn away, what happened uh, to the horse named Preakness? We now have a stakes named Preakness. What happened to the horse? It's got a sad ending, but with the silver lining. It was sold to the Duke of Hamilton in England, and apparently Preakness the horse didn't like uh, England, or at least didn't like the Duke, for he kicked him. The Duke got so mad that he shot the horse. Um, that is the sad part. The silver lining is is there was such a public outcry that it was one of the catalysts that sparked anti-animal cruelty laws in England. Um, all right, so let's turn back to the first Preakness. That was held on, um, let me get the date right, May 27th, 1873. Uh, two years before the Kentucky Derby, if you're a horse fan or a Baltimore lover. Um, it was a wet, soggy day. I think, in my experience, it is always a wet, soggy day uh, on uh, Preakness Day. Um, there were seven horses entered in that first race. The favorite was a horse called Catesby that was owned by none other than Odin Bowie. Um, and let me uh, just say that Bowie's horse did not win. Uh, he came in fourth, I think, 23 legs behind, or 23 lengths behind. The winner uh, was a horse named Survivor that overcame 11 to 1 odds, claimed the $1,800 purse, and I think uh, winning at 10 lengths is still holds the record for the uh, largest margin of victory. So now let's turn to the Preakness, which has been run here every year since 1873 except it hasn't. In the 1880s, there was such a dismal showing, only two horses, that by 1890, it had moved uh, to New York. And then for a number of years, it wasn't run at all. It resurfaces in 1894 in Brooklyn, where it's run uh, for a number of years, and then finally comes back here to Baltimore, to Pimlico, in 1909. The winning jockey then was very excited, apparently, that it came back here. Um, the jockey's name was William Dorsey. Oil, and when he passed away, he asked that his ashes be spread across the finish line here at the racetrack, and they were. Apparently, by 1909, Baltimore was ready again for a big-time horse racing because in 1910, just a year later, there were such large crowds that Pimlico had to open up the infield for them, thus beginning our famous or maybe infamous tradition of infield at Preakness. Um, let me wrap up with a word about the trophy, the Wood Lawn Vase. Um, it is supposed to be the most valuable uh, trophy in all of professional sports. It is uh, priceless. It is a work of art, but uh, its value is estimated 
estimated at somewhere over four million dollars. It was made by Tiffany and Company in 1860 for a racetrack in Kentucky called Woodwan. That's why it's known as the Woodwan vase. It is three feet tall, 30 pounds, and made of solid sterling silver. At the base are four horseshoes plus saddles and jockey caps and whips. Uh, the middle uh, depicts pastures, one with a mare and foal and the other with a stallion. The bowl has four shields on it. One depicts a horse, one depicts the Woodlawn racetrack, and one is left blank for the current winner, and one is left blank for a list of the past winners. Um, the top is a full horse and jockey. Uh, to say that it is spectacular is an understatement. For many years, the owner got to keep the vase for a year until the next Preakness, but in 1953, the owner, the winning owner was Alfred Vanderbilt. He took it home, uh, but his very wise wife, Jeannie, said, holy cow, if something happens to this vase, it's our fault. Let's give it back. And they did. That was the last, uh, they were the last people to take the vase home. So this year, like every year since 1953, the owner gets to take home and keep a one-third replica of the Woodlawn vase. The jockey and trainer get to take home smaller versions. And if you're watching in person or on TV, you'll see that uh, in the 149th Preakness, like always, the owner is presented with the real thing, the real Woodlawn vase. But if you look carefully, you will notice that it is accompanied by the Maryland National Guard. And when all of the hoopla is over and the cameras are turned off, it is accompanied promptly back to its permanent home at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Thanks so much, and we'll see you soon.